Let's pray together, and we're going to do 1 John 4. Father, I just thank you for these precious people who have come tonight, Lord, after a long day of work and labor, and uh, many of them feeling very tired, but, Lord, they came to hear the word of God. And, Lord, I just thank you for them, and I pray that you'll make it well worth their while, that, Lord, you'll feed us the manna from heaven, the word of God. Build us up in the faith. Give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Give us insight. Help us to walk with Jesus better. And thank you for helping us to bring forth much fruit in Jesus' name. Will you breathe a prayer up and just say, Lord, speak to me tonight. I receive the engrafted word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give the Lord praise. Turn around and welcome everybody watching by streaming video. Say hello there. Give them a wave. We welcome all of you by streaming video. God bless you. Good to have you with us. Amen. All righty. Now do you have your Bibles? How many of you read ahead through chapter four? Did you read ahead? All right. A lot of you did. All right. Now this is good stuff. First John is just so good. It's so simple because John wrote very simple. Uh, he's not Pauline. Uh, Paul whole paragraphs of, of Paul's are just one sentence. He, he's, he's a comma master. But John, very simple, brief, complete sentences, very easy to understand. So tonight, we're going to go into chapter 4. Last time, we closed chapter 3 with John stating that the Spirit of God resides in any true child of God. If you're truly born again, the Spirit of God resides in you. How many of you are thankful for the Spirit of God? Paul said the very same thing. He said, but if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, watch this, everyone, he does not belong to him and is not a child of God. So not everybody's God's children. Not everybody's God's child. Everybody's created by God, but not everybody is a child of God. You must be born again or you're not a child of God. You haven't been begotten of God. So that's the message. Now, since John's first letter is all about knowing for certain various spiritual truths like how to know you're truly saved, how to know you're walking in the light, how to know you're walking with Jesus, it's not a surprise at all that chapter four opens up with an exhortation to walk in discernment. Can everybody say discernment with me? Now, if you were to ask me, Pastor Jeff, what is the biggest need in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ today, I would have to tell you at the top of the list, discernment. Discernment is that ability to discern between good and evil, right and wrong, light and dark, evil and righteousness, um, what is of God and what is not of God, what is the devil and what is Christ. It's the ability to discern between two things. Now, John says at verse 1, opening chapter 4, Beloved, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Wow. Isn't that powerful? Now, he's already told us in chapter 2, verse 27, going back a couple of chapters, he says, the anointing that you received, and that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the anointing you received when you got saved. The anointing you received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But his anointing teaches you about how many things, everybody? So watch this now. When the Spirit of God came into you, he gave you God's love. We're going to look at that in a little bit. He gave you God's peace, did he not? But he also gave you the ability to discern. A teacher came to live inside of you. Jesus Christ lives inside of us via the Holy Spirit. And Jesus was called Rabbi, the teacher. So the Holy Spirit is a teacher. And what does he teach us? He teaches us about everything. Jesus said, it's to your advantage that I go. For if I do not go, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, won't come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he's going to bring to your remembrance everything that I have said. And he's going to convict you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. In other words, he's going to show you 
that you are in sin and need a Savior. So immediately when the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us, he discerns for us. He begins to teach us right from wrong, good from bad, light from dark. So the Spirit of God living inside every believer helps us discern truth from error, what is from God and what is not from God. Oh, that's so important in this day of deception that we're living in right now. Now, he says, don't believe every spirit. The, the three words, do not believe, is in the imperative tense in Greek. And that, here's what that means. It means it's a command. It's imperative. He's not making a suggestion. He's, saying, he's not saying, pray about testing the spirits. He is saying, I'm commanding you by the Spirit of God, don't believe every spirit. You might translate it this way. Stop believing every spirit. Stop believing every spirit. Just because they're on Christian television or Christian radio or in a Christian bookstore doesn't mean it's Christian. That's a shock to some of you, but it's true. More than one kind of spirit. Now, notice he says, don't believe every spirit, plural. Don't believe every spirit. Because more than one kind of spirit sought to control or at least influence the minds and the hearts of Christians in John's day, and they do us now. We are confronted with spirits every day that are not of God. Spirits. And what do spirits use? They use people. Amen? Amen. Who does the Holy Spirit use? People. Who does the devil use? People. And John is saying the spirits he mentions refer to a person or persons dominated or influenced by a demonic spirit or spirits. All right? See, I personally believe if you're not full of the Holy Spirit, you got some other spirit working on you. That's the world we live in now. All right? I didn't say everybody was possessed, but certainly everybody is influenced by spirits of one kind or another. Now, these wrong spirits operating in others, like false teachers or, or media personalities, we could go through a list, seek to control, deceive, or influence for the purpose of power and control. Some examples or types of demonic forces that work in people and through people. I, I just listed a few here. Spirits of religiosity. Spirits of lying, a lying spirit. Spirit of accusation. Boy, is that one alive and well today. The accuser of the brethren is alive and well. Deception, that's a huge one today. But that's a spirit. It's a spirit of deception. The devil's a deceiver. He's a liar. How do you know he's talking uh, if he's lying? Or how do you know he's lying if he's talking? You know he's lying if he's talking. If he's talking, he's lying. There's a spirit of pride. There's a spirit of lust. There's a spirit of greed. There's spirits of depression. And they operate in people. I gave you a bunch of verses here if you want to just make sure this is the word of God. Now, here's what John is saying. He, let's repeat it. He says, beloved, don't believe, stop believing every spirit that approaches you. Now, he's talking to Christians. He's warning believers against giving ear to people that are energized, not by the Holy Spirit, but by a demonic false spirit. Paul the Apostle warned that many believers would fall prey to this very thing in the last days. What did he say? 1 Timothy 4.1, you ought to have this one on your refrigerator. Now, the Holy Spirit tells us clearly. In other words, he's speaking to me distinctly, says Paul. That in the last days, the last times, some are going to turn away from what faith, everyone? The true faith. The faith. The faith. Christ. They will follow what? Say it with me. Deceptive spirits. And teachings that come from where? Okay, now notice that. He says, the Spirit of God is, is clearly telling me beyond the shadow of a doubt that in the last days... Some are going to walk away from the true faith in Jesus Christ because they have been giving ear to what John is warning us against. 
They've been giving ear to a false spirit, to a, a wrong spirit, to a demonic spirit, teachings that literally come from demons. And man, could I go through a list of things taught by demons today? I mean, you go into any, any bookstore and, and just go to the religion section or go to the new age section or go to the philosophy section. And just look at what's there. I mean, they're everywhere. There is an infestation of false teaching, demonic teaching, deceptive teaching that has infiltrated every corner of America. So John says, test them. Test the spirits that are speaking through people you're listening to. Who you're listening to? Who, who has your ear? I'm amazed sometimes who, who Christians listen to. I mean, you could start with TV, you could start with news personalities, some of these talk shows that are just loony bins, and, and, and people sit there and they, they take in these constant, secular, worldly, mystical, new age ideas all day long, and then they wonder why they don't sense God's peace or why they're not having victory in their spiritual lives. It matters who you give your ear to. It matters who you give your attention to. Who has your ear as a believer? Boy, you ought to be very, very discerning and selective and careful who you give your ear to, your heart to, your attention to, your energy to in these days. Are you kidding me? He says, test the spirits. Look beyond the person. Look beyond the charisma. Look beyond their speaking ability, who they claim to be representing. Many of them claim to represent God. And test the spirit that is coming through them. You need to ask yourself, is this the Holy Spirit I'm hearing? Is it sound doctrine? Is it from God? Or is it false, deceptive, and coming from a false spirit, even a demonic spirit? Where is it coming from? I could name names, but I'm not going to go there. You're not, you're not dumb. Why do I go through whole books of the Bible on Wednesday nights? Because the only way to test the spirits is by the word of God. How do we test the spirit? He said, test the spirit. Don't believe every spirit. Stop believing every spirit. Test the spirits. But how do we test the spirit? Well, let me tell you, not necessarily by your feelings. Although the Holy Spirit will often give you a check about someone or something you're listening. How many of you have ever been listening to somebody and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit just gave you a check and boy, a wall went up and God said, you need to turn this off. Come on, let me see your hands, right? All right, that's great because the Holy Spirit does do that. But listen to the preacher now, it's not foolproof. Your ability to discern emotionally and from within here is not foolproof. If it were foolproof, nobody would be getting deceived. But so many are getting deceived by false spirits. And, and they'll tell you, well, you know, at first I, you know, I thought they were wrong, but then I just began to feel a peace or I began to feel okay about them. But, but when we check into what you've been listening to, we know it's false, but you have been taken in or, and, and I've been taken in before. I'm not just pointing fingers. It's happened to me before where I've heard somebody very convincing very smooth, smooth operators, okay? Smooth operators, and they talk smooth. Oh, they're so good with words, and I've been fooled before, and I learned. You can, you can, it can feel right and yet still be wrong. So what's the foolproof way? The best way to test the spirit is to hold their words up to the word of God. Let me say that again. The best way to test the spirit is you got to hold the words you're hearing up to the word of God. Oh man, every believer in the world these days ought to be hugging your Bible. You ought to be holding that Bible tighter than you hold almost anything else in the world because that's the word of God. You test it by the word of God. Is what they're saying or how they're living biblical. Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruit. But if you don't know the word of God, how are you going to know what fruit is right or not? Amen. Does the Bible amen what they're claiming to be true? But of course, if you don't know the Bible, 
you will never be able to obey this verse. You will never be able to do what John said. Test the spirits. Don't believe every spirit. Stop listening to every spirit. Test them. But you'll never be able to obey that verse if you don't know your Bible really well. Really well. If you were about to drive through, oh, let's say 20 miles, 20 miles of alligator infested swamp. Let's say you're on a boat and you're about to you're about to float through about 20 miles of alligator infested swamp and you know that if you take a wrong turn it's going to make you pray to the alligators and I have given you a map and this map shows you the right way to go and the wrong ways to go. And you know that if you don't know that map really well, you're going to become an alligator dinner before sunset. I want to know, how well would you study that map? How well would you study that map? Because here they are. They're on your right. They're on your left. They're behind you. They're in front of you. And I've given you a map, and it's a narrow way that leads from one end of this 20-mile stretch to the other. And if you don't read that map very carefully, you're going to meet a very bad ending. How many of you would read that map real carefully before you rode the first row? That's your Bible because that's the world we live in. You go to the left, there's alligators. You go to the right, there's alligators. You go behind you, there's alligators. You go in front of you, there's alligators. But Jesus said, if you walk the narrow path that leads to life that I give to you, follow my teachings, no weapon formed against you will prosper. And every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you will condemn. And he will get you to the other side. But you got to know that map. So everybody say, know your Bible. Boy, as Jesus in the wilderness, did he not meet an alligator? He met the devil himself. Satan himself came to Jesus. And how did he beat him? Every time when the devil would lie about the word of God, Jesus knew the word of God so well that he, he, he caught the twist every time and shut him down. It says the devil finally left him until an opportune time. He gave up on him. Wouldn't you love the devil to give up on you? I can't get anywhere with them. Right? Wouldn't you love the devil to give up on you? Wouldn't you love to know the devil walked away from you frustrated? I cannot get to them. They know too much Bible. Okay, know the Bible. That's how you test the spirits. But then there's another way to know if a spirit speaking through someone is of God. John says, by this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is not the Antichrist, the man, but it's the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. See, there's the Antichrist, the man that's going to come one day, but the spirit of Antichrist, the spirit that opposes Christ, is in a lot of people in our culture right now. They hate Christ. Now, keep in mind, when, when John said, okay, you want to know an acid test to figure out if somebody is of God or not? Ask him if Jesus came in the flesh. John was dealing with a false teaching prominent in his day called Gnosticism. Gnosticism taught that Jesus had not come in the flesh. That was one of the identifying hallmarks of the Gnostic teaching. Jesus was a spirit. He never came in the flesh. And this, of course, destroyed the truth of the gospel that proclaims God's love was revealed by sending his only begotten son in the flesh. John 1.14 says, the word became flesh. Can we say that together? The word became flesh. But see, if you had been under a Gnostic teacher, they would have said, no, 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 no. He didn't come in the flesh. He, he didn't become a real man. And, and that was spreading through the early church. So John writes, he says, no, no, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So catch this now. John is informing the believers of his day that if they were to ask a Gnostic false teacher, hey, did Jesus come in the flesh? They would have to say no, because they were Gnostic teachers, and you would have had them. But listen to me. On the flip side, 
I can tell you that many false teachers in our day will quickly tell you Jesus came in the flesh. You know why? Because their, their deception is not of the Gnostic strain. They're not Gnostics. So you can ask false teachers, hey, Jesus come in the flesh. Oh, yeah, Jesus came in the flesh. Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah. But then you listen to them, and they're teaching false teaching. So it, it's, it's a good test, but it's not, again, a foolproof one. Because wrong people can say right things. As a matter of fact, folks, most false teaching is more truth than false. So that you're pulled in. Oh, yeah, that's true. Well, that's true, and that's true, and that's true. And then a good false teacher will get you hooked on the good things and the right things, and then they'll throw the bat one time on a Wednesday night. I brought a blender with me to the Wednesday night service. I really did. I plugged it in. And I brought bluebell ice cream. I brought chocolate. I brought vanilla. And I brought some fruit. And right there in front of everybody, I put it all in. I put the lid on. I hit liquefy. But before I put the lid on, get ready, I had a little tiny bit of what I said was dog poopy. It wasn't, but I said it was. I mean, little, and I dropped it in, and I hit liquefy. And I, when I was all done, I took the lid off, and I said, look at this. How many of you would love a drink? And they all said, no way, that's gross, Pastor Jeff. And I said, but wait a minute. That little tiny bit of dog poopy was like, one half of 1% of the whole shake. So why should it matter to you? Because we, just knowing that a little bit's in there ruins the whole thing. It's that way with false teaching. I couldn't get anybody to drink any that night. So people say, oh, well, you know, but they're mainly right. But why would you sit and listen to spiritual poopy? right? Come on. You got to protect your spiritual stomach just like you do your physical stomach. False teachers in our day may be teaching a form of Christianity that's not biblical, a form of Christianity, but it's not biblical. Their message can focus inordinately on money. We got a lot of that. You know what most heresy is? Most heresy is a truth taken to an extreme. That's what most heresy is. So you'll hear some people just on and on and on and on and on about money. And if you're new to the faith and you didn't know anything about Christianity, you just listen to them, you're going to think the only reason you got saved was for God to make you rich. And it's all materialism. When the New Testament doesn't teach this at all. Not at all. The New Testament's all about spiritual riches. Now, he will take care of you. No doubt, he's our provider, and we can't lose that truth. But is he all about material things? No. He's all about spiritual riches. James said, has not God made the poor of this world rich in faith? Wait a minute. There are some teachers who would say, you can't be poor and be rich in faith, because if you're rich in faith, you won't be poor. That's not what James says. James says, if you're you can be poor in faith or, or poor in this world, but be rich in faith. You can be poor materially, but be rich in faith. So they may be inordinately focused on money or sexual license. There's a terrible thing that has happened in our country. This whole, this whole thing with the same-sex marriage and the whole homosexual argument that after all, it's really not a sin. There's been whole books written on it, some of them bestsellers by people claiming to be Christian but living a homosexual lifestyle. And they've written whole books on it, became bestsellers, been on all the talk shows. And if you don't know your Bible, you're going to be pulled into that. See, look, I'm hugging my Bible tight. 
Every once in a while, I give it a big kiss. I, I kiss a Bible page. When it reaches out and blesses me, I can't help it. I kiss that Bible page. He said, that's weird, Pastor Jeff. Not near as weird as what people are out there doing otherwise. Everybody else coming out of the closet, we might as well too. I don't mind kissing the word of God. Amen. I don't do it very often. Don't go around. My, my pastor kisses his Bible all the time. No, it's pretty rare. But when I get really touched, oh, yeah. All right. Or that some of the things God condemns aren't really sinful. We just talked about that. Or, or listen, they misrepresent, the, the, the false teachers of our day, misrepresent true Christian living. What it really means to live a Christian life. You will never hear these false teachers talk about discipleship, the cost of following Jesus, crucifying your flesh, you almost never hear. Hardship, being in the will of God, persecution, some of the tougher things you'll experience as a believer. You don't hear any of that. You just hear God wants to bless you here, there, and everywhere. God's a big bless me machine in the sky. You give only out of a slot machine mentality. If I give, God will give back to me. When we ought to give, no matter if God gives back to us anything or not. So the only way to try the spirits is to hold their teaching up to the word of God. If it's sound doctrine, you're going to know it by the word of God. If it's not sound, the Bible's not going to support their message. So the bottom line, I want everybody to read what I have in all caps there. Read it out loud with me, please, everybody. Know the word of God like the back of your hand. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Come on. Now, next, John tells yet another way to mark or to recognize those preaching a false message and he begins with a word of encouragement. He says, you are of God, little children. Isn't that great to hear? You are of God, little children. And you have overcome them. Who's the them? The false teachers. Because he who is in you is greater. Don't you love this verse? He who is in you. Let's read it together. He who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Isn't that true? And that's talking about the spirit of God in you. Now, the spirit of God living in you is greater than any false spirit trying to lure you away from Christ. And then he says in verse 5, they, that is the false teachers, are of the world. Now, watch this. This is great. This is insightful. Therefore, they speak as of the world. And who hears them? The world. We, on the other hand, are of God. He who knows God Hears who? See, now, you're hearing me tonight if you're a believer and you're soaking up the word of God and you're loving it. But if there were some people in here that were lost, you know what? They'd be perplexed about a lot of the things that I'm saying. And they would probably already be mad a little bit about some of the things I've said. Because if you're ministering the word of God, watch this, the world doesn't hear you. They don't accept it. They don't understand it. By this we know, the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. By what? People who are energized by a false, deceptive spirit are of and from the world. They are not of or from God. And because they are of the world, the world hears and receives their message, applauds them. When they're of the world, teaching a false doctrine, the world that's living in deceit, under the, the lie of the devil. The Bible says the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So that if you stand up and you're a false teacher, the world's going to receive you, applaud you. That's why these new age books are flying off the shelves. And because they're of the world, the world hears and receives their message. This is why Jesus warned, woe to you. When all men speak well of you, for their fathers used to treat the false prophets in the same way. Listen to the Living Bible. What sadness is ahead for those praised by the crowds? That means praised by the world. For false prophets have always been praised by the world. When I see somebody claiming to be a Christian preacher or teacher, 
being celebrated and received by the world, if all the talk shows love them, if all the media personalities love them, if the news media loves them, showers love on them, protects them from criticism, I know they are not teaching the word of God. I know it. See, I wonder about the content of their message. When I see the media personalities that ABC, CBS, NBC, can I name some names? MSNBC, CNN, more and more Fox. When I see them applauding somebody, I know I'm not going to agree with that person. Because they, they perpetuate the world's message. They, they, they are of the world, and when they speak to the world, the world receives them because the world resonates with the world. But if I'm a gospel preacher, a real one, and I'm saying Jesus is the only way, the word of God is the inerrant word of God, the Bible is the inerrant word of God, I believe it is absolute truth. If I say you're not going to go to heaven unless you go by Christ, if I say things like that, let me tell you who's not going to accept me for five minutes. I'm never going to get applause from ABC, CBS, NBC, MSNBC, CNN, more and more Fox, most newspapers. They're not going to amen me because the world doesn't hear me. Are you there? Are you there? Come on. Say, well, Jeff, that just that sounds hard to me. Well, no harder than Jesus. Jesus said, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, listen, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. But I've chosen you where, everybody? Out of the world. And what does he say next? That is why the world hates you. So if I'm staying true to the word of God, let me tell you who's not going to applaud me. That world out there. But false teachers who say they're Christians, but they got a false message, world loves them. Oh, yeah, come on, be on my show. Let me interview you. Push your books. So John says that not only will the true believer reject false teachers, but false teachers will reject true believers. Now, John spends the rest of chapter four on his favorite topic, love. Everybody say love. Now, I'm not going to the Beatles, but let's say it. All you need is? That's the one true thing they said, and, and it's kind of true, not true, because they didn't mean the Jesus kind of love. But if you're a believer, you're called to love. Now, look at verse seven. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. He who does not love doesn't know God, for God is love. Notice he doesn't just love. His character, his essence is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us. That God sent his only begotten. How did he show us that he loved us? He sent his only begotten son into the world. That's how his love was manifested to us. He sent his only begotten son into the world. Why? So that we could live through him. And this is love. Not that we love God, but he loved us. And sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now verse 11. Beloved of God so loved us. If he loved us enough to give his son, then we can at least love one another. Because while we were yet sinners, he died for us. So while we were living in sin and cursing God, Jesus loved us enough to die for us. So the idea is this. Now, if we love one another, John contends it's a mark of true salvation. You're surely, he says, born of God, and you know God, if you walk in love. Conversely, John contends that if you have no love for others, you don't know God as you ought. Now, you got to be careful with the language here, and here's where it's good to go into a little bit of Greek, and I'm not going to carry you into Greek, but I'm going to tell you what the Greek says, because if, if you're not careful, John can make you feel condemned. Because how many of you can say, well, I love people, but hey, I come real short of the mark sometimes. Come on, look at me so holy. How many of you wish you loved more? And how many got somebody in your life you find it hard to even like, much less? Come on, 
Oh, all the hands went up right there. So it's easy to read this and get condemned, right? You understand? You know, if I, if I don't understand the language, I'm going, wow, he who doesn't love does not know God? Well, there's a lot of times I don't love perfectly. I fall short. I, I struggle. Some people make it hard to love them, right? Keep staring right up at me. Don't look at your spouse. Look at me. No, it's so easy to love Cindy. And, and she would say, it's, it's easy most of the time to love Jeff. No, no. Now, here's the deal. Now, watch. Here's the, but isn't it easy to be condemned reading that? Because we go, uh-oh, well, I'm falling short, so am I saved? But here's the idea. Love is a process. Spiritual growth is a process. Salvation happens instantly. But... Spiritual maturity is a lifelong process. We grow in love. We grow in patience. We grow in peace. We grow in our ability to crucify the flesh. We grow in our ability. We grow in freedom. I'm freer tonight than I was probably 10 years ago. Freedom is a process. Okay? So love is a process. So he's not saying if you don't love everybody perfectly, you're probably not saved. That's not what he's saying. Um. And I think there's another idea here too. You might know other things about God, his holiness, his righteousness. You might have a real good grip on his judgment. You might really understand his sovereignty. He's in charge of all things. But you, but you don't really have a lot of knowledge about God's love. You haven't experienced his love. And you know what? A lot of people go through this. There's a lot of people raised in really strict religious homes, for instance, full of rules and regulations, and, and people that emerge from homes like that, okay, always beating or coming down on you in, in the name of God, you know what God requires regarding clean living, you know what he requires regarding obedience to parents, and, and things like that, but you've never experienced the beauty of God's mercy and his love. You emerge from homes like that, um, with, with your, your toolkit, your spiritual toolkit is lacking. You, you got the judgment down, you got the right living down, but you've never really been introduced to his love, just strict religion. And I think you can't give what you don't have. You can't give what hasn't been put in you. How many of you know that's true? You, you, can't, you can't give love if it's not there. You can't give mercy if, if it's not here. You can't give what you don't have. You can't give Jesus somebody if you don't have him yourself. Okay? It's got to be put in you before you can give it. And I think John is saying, if you don't love others, you have not come to know God's love yourself like you should. So we need a real good baptism in the love of God. Paul said, it's the very love of God that constrains us, that drives us, that we're all about. It's his love. I can tell you it was the love of the Holy Ghost being poured out in my heart that changed me. I believe this. The more we learn about God, the more we're going to be like God. That's why it's so good to know the word of God. Why I always harp on it all the time. Because you read that Bible, what does it say? When we see him, we will be like him. For we will see him as he is. And Paul said in Corinthians, he said, we go from faith to faith and glory to glory, always beholding the glory of the Lord. And where? In the word. So as you behold his glory in the word, you're changed, transformed by the renewing of your mind. Boy, this is good stuff. I should have been doing this on Sunday. Okay. No one, verse 12, has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us, what everyone? His spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Now, there's another proof. You can't say with all of your being, he's the son of God and not be saved. 
And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. He who abides in love abides in God and God in him. So here, John's talking about seeing God through his love. We have never seen him with our eyes, but how do we know God? How do we see God? Through his love. We see God through his love. God is invisible. Paul wrote, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Jesus said, God is spirit. But though he is invisible, we know him, we see him through his love. The mark and the evidence of his presence is his love within us and our love towards others. We can't see him with our eyes, but how do we see him? His love. His love. And how do others see him in us? His love. This is how we know we abide in him. Because he has given us his spirit, and his spirit pours out his love in us. Listen to what Paul said. The love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So when we met him, we met his love. We didn't see God, but we saw him through his love. How did we experience his love? The Holy Spirit was poured out in our hearts. And that's where the love came in. And that is what changed Jeff Wickwire's life, I can tell you. The love of God shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Ghost. I got hooked fast. I love the love of God. Amen? I love the love of God. The Amplified puts it this way, we've come to know by personal observation and experience and have believed with deep, consistent faith the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides continually in him. So though God is invisible, everybody, we see him and know him through the love he has poured out on us. Amen? Jesus said God so loved the world. He said, gave his only begotten son. So God's act of sending Jesus to die for us was an act of pure love from start to finish. So we know God through love. We see God through love. And third, John talks about the consummation of God's love. Verse 17, love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. That, but perfect love casts out fear. Isn't that good? Amen. Perfect love, God's love, chases fear out because fear involves torment. If you're full of fear, you're tormented. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him. Why, everybody? Because he first loved us. Now, once we experience God's love through Jesus Christ, here's where John's going with this. The fear of coming judgment for sin is removed from us. I have a theory, I can't prove it, I'm not a psychologist, but here's my theory. I believe all fear, you name the fear, I don't care what it is, phobia, fear, you name it, I believe all fear has the root in the fear of death. And the fear of death is the fear of judgment. What's happening after I die? John is saying, when we come to know that we have been washed in the blood of the lamb and our sin is removed. It takes that primal fear out of us. We know we're not going to be judged. Okay? It takes that primal fear out. There is no fear in love. No fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear because fear of judgment involves torment. I remember reading about the 18th century Enlightenment atheist named Voltaire. Voltaire was a brilliant man, brilliant writer. He ruled Europe during the 1700s, late 1700s, mid to late 1700s as a philosopher, as, a, as an atheist, uh, skeptic, uh, uh, very powerful words. And, and he mocked Christians, he mocked the Bible. He, he predicted Christianity would be extinct within a certain amount of time. But I read of his death. I read of the terrors of his death. 
and how in the middle of the night he shrieked in terror as he was dying. Why? Fear of judgment. That's the primal fear from which all other fears spring. And that's how he died. But see, if he had come to Christ, he had had none of that fear. Because perfect love casts out the fear of judgment. And who has perfect love? Christ. Amen. 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 The book of Hebrews says that Jesus sets free, quote, those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. Why were they afraid of dying? Because there are guilt over sin and its eternal consequences. But God's love has removed all of that through Jesus Christ. And John reminds us who made, who made the first overture in our relationship with God through Christ. He said we love him because he first loved us. God romanced you. You didn't romance God. God romanced you. He asked you out on the first date. Amen? Aren't you glad you dated him? And then aren't you glad you married him? Amen. All right, we're coming to a close. So we, we know God through love. We see God through love. We have the consummation of God's love. And finally, he ends chapter 4 by talking about the obedience of love. Verse 20, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother who he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. So notice, it's a commandment, not a suggestion that we walk in love. Jesus gave only one commandment. Moses gave 10, Jesus gave one. He said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And that's the end of chapter four. Isn't that good stuff? Can we stand together tonight? Amen. How many of you are glad for the word of God? Isn't it powerful and beautiful? Can we just lift our hands to the Lord of love? Lord, we just thank you tonight for the love of God, for the word of God, that we love you only because you first loved us. We thank you that you're the one that came knocking. You're the one that asked the first date. You're the one that took us out the first time. You're the one that approached us. We didn't approach you. You approached us and you chose us. We didn't choose you. And Lord, because you made the overture, we love you tonight. Can we just say to him, I love you, Lord Jesus. I love you, Lord Jesus. I love you tonight, Lord Jesus. Just tell him, just romance the Lord for a minute. Can you just love him tonight? We're not in religion, we're in a relationship. Just love the Lord tonight. Thank you, Lord, we love you, Lord. Tell him you love him. Tell him, thank you for a couple of things. Just take a moment and be with Jesus. He's here with us right now. Thank you, Lord.